Good afternoon and welcome to the second in the series of videos on the um, James Cook's uh, expeditions and journals. Um, uh, these were actually uh, made for, uh, as most of you are aware, uh, were made for a um, uh, an aggregation uh, course at the University of Rouen. Um, although th this is not, I'd like to point out, this is not the entire course. There's a lot of things that I've um, spoken about in class that I'm not going to speak about on the videos. On the videos, I'm going to just concentrate on the timeline and opening up um, the uh, uh, themes and questions which are suggested by um, different episodes. And I'm going to go through the journals from the beginning to the end, uh, not, 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 not stopping on every page. Uh, this uh, sculpture in front of you is by the by, by the uh, British artist Mark Wallinger, uh, and it's uh, you can see it in London next to the London School of Economics, and it's simply called "The World Turned Upside Down," uh, and it's a globe of the world, but where we would normally put the uh, uh, put the uh, North Pole at the top, uh, it's put the South Pole at the top, and all the writing is the other way up, uh, and so it's just to. Uh, uh, I think the artist is just trying to tell us to remember that the way that we always see the world with Europe at the centre might not be the only possible way to um, to see it. Also, you also see in, in here the, uh, the the tremendous amount of space available for a uh, an unknown southern continent if there had been one. So let me get back to this uh, expedition and the first expedition. That's where he's going to go. You can see him starting from uh, 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 Britain. Uh, I, I think you missed Britain off a little bit there. Yes, uh, go, go, going down round uh, round uh, South America and, uh, and and onwards. Uh, and this is the here's how the Daily Mail uh, um, summarizes uh, his. Uh, his voyages of, of, of discovery are there. And so you can see the, uh, um, the 78, 68 to 71. This is a, a summary uh, of, the of the first one then, and you can see heading down around South America to Tahiti, uh, and then over to New Zealand, all the way around New Zealand, uh, up the side of, uh, of uh, New Holland, which is now Australia, uh, and to Jakarta, and then home. Uh, although by the time he got home, many people had thought that he was uh, dead and lost, as many people were. Uh, here we have a very, <coughs> very short timeline, uh, just for you to, to try and keep them in mind. You're leaving Plymouth, uh, uh, so six months or so, no, it's five months until, no, sorry, 18 months, is that right? No, no. Sorry, six months or so, or five months or so, to get to the south of, uh, of South America, Tierra del Fuego. Uh, stopping in Tahiti, where there had been two other ships which had quite recently been to visit, uh, and the contrast between the, uh, the, the, the three uh, explorers is quite interesting. Uh, by 1769, then by October 1769, to New Zealand Aotearoa. Um, this is the, the double name, which is uh, very frequently used for New Zealand today, uh, with uh, the um, Maori name afterwards. Uh, April 17, uh, all the way around New Zealand, April 17, 1770, Australia, well, New Holland at the time. Big problem at the Great Barrier Reef, where they, he almost disappeared forever. Uh, right up the side and to Batavia, which is modern day Jakarta. Uh, terrible illness and sickness there uh, by March 1771 to the south of, uh, of uh, Africa. Uh, now, the expedition. I think this first expedition shows something about the nature of uh, British uh, imperial expansion, which was often opportunistic rather than highly organized. In India, whole swathes of land were taken over because of the individual initiative, without asking too many, uh, too many people's opinion, uh, of Clive of India, the Robert Clive. Uh, and in this case, you also see uh, that some of this imperial expansion is, is somewhat accidental. And indeed, uh, uh, Cook's aim is to explore and map for future use uh, for the empire. But then it's this accidental uh, element where Joseph Banks uh, suggests that uh, uh, Sydney would make a good, uh, Botany Bay would make a good um, prison camp, which then leads to uh, uh, colonization of Australia, which has a large, uh, a certain number of uh, accidental uh, elements and even Cook's expedition itself. In this particular case, it's the Royal Society, then a bunch of scientists who saw how important the transit of Venus was uh, and how it had been so badly uh, measured uh, a few years before. 
uh, and uh, this group wanted Britain to have a key role in the advancing of international silence, science, but the Royal Society certainly did not have the money to buy and equip a ship, and so they petitioned the Admiralty, the Royal Navy, uh, who chose a military man. Naturally, they weren't going to choose a scientist to captain the, to captain the ship. Although <coughs> James Cook did have a certain amount of scientific interest and indeed would present um, some of his uh, uh, astronomical findings uh, uh, at the Royal Society some uh, time later. The Admiralty saw this plan, oh right, they want a ship to go for this scientific thing in, uh, uh, in, 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 in Tahiti um, and measure the, the uh, transit of Venus. The Admiralty saw an opportunity to, to think further about colonial expansion and possibly win the big prize, control over the southern continent that most people were confident uh, existed. And hence the secret instructions, uh, the uh, plans of uh, Cook to explore uh, had to stay secret from colonial competitors. Uh, because they were all more or less respected this uh, idea that if you claim a land in the name of the king uh, of Holland or of, uh, of the Netherlands or of Spain or of anywhere, uh, then that counts for something. So notice then that this is a somewhat haphazard route to imperial expansion. The, the building of the British Empire was not a carefully thought out plan by an executive committee of the newly powerful industrial classes. It was uh, industrial and commercial classes. It was haphazard, sometimes partly accidental, and it produced its own agents. This brings up a number of questions. Why did they choose Cook when he was so comparatively junior? I don't have the answer to that one, incidentally. Uh, why did he have only one ship? Now, uh, uh, sailing at the time is tremendously dangerous. Uh, and uh, we're not surprised at all that in the second and the third expedition, Cook has two ships. It's much safer with two ships because if one of them goes down, you have a fighting chance of being saved. So why did Cook have only one ship in the first expedition? I'm not certain, but it may be because he really wasn't that important to the Admiralty. Anyway, off Cook goes uh, with his three sets of instructions. Three sets of instructions. Oh, my God. Three? Firstly, the open instructions to observe in Tahiti the transit of Venus. Secondly, the secret instructions to then head south and look for the southern continent in a systematic manner. <coughs> and here you have the picture of the additional instructions from the uh, Admiralty. What did they say? Here's the first words. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to make myself a little bit smaller so you can see all the words there. Here's the first words. Whereas the making discoveries of countries hitherto unknown and the attaining a knowledge of distant parts which though formerly discovered have yet been but imperfectly explore, explored will redound greatly to the honour of this nation as a maritime power as well as to the dignity of the, to the, the crown of Great Britain and may tend greatly to the advancement of the trade and navigation thereof and whereas there is reason to imagine that a continent or land of great extent may be found to the southward of the tract lately made by Captain Wallace in his Manchester ship the Dolphin of which you will hear with receive a copy or of the tract of any former navigators in pursuit of the like kind, you are to proceed. Oh, sorry, not that one. You are to proceed to the southward to, in order to make discovery of the continent above mentioned until you arrive at a latitude of 40 degrees, unless you, you sooner fall in with it. We don't have, we don't have everything uh, uh, on there. The second page of the same instructions instructs Cook, with the consent of the natives, to take possession of convenient situations in the country in the name of the King of Great Britain. Now, these uh, instructions, including text which has been much analysed and commented on about taking people's lands, um, are tremendously important and even uh, I, I will come back to the question of with the consent of the natives uh, 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 a little later here is more of the instructions you are also instructed to observe the nature of the soil and the products thereof the beasts and fowls that inhabit or frequent it the fishes 
that are to be found in the rivers or upon the coast, and in what plenty, and in case you find any mines, minerals, minerals or valuable stones, you are to bring home specimens of each, and also such specimens of the seeds of the tree, fruits and grains as you may be able to collect. The colonial intentions are quite clear. And certainly the consent of the natives was going to be more than secondary. There were also the third set of instructions, third set of instructions, not quite instructions, they were called hints. These were by the Royal Societies, and these were not by military people. This was written by the Royal Society, and then the president of the Royal Society, the chair, whose name I've forgotten momentarily. Uh, and they gave uh, some uh, ideas to Cook. This is what they said. Uh, we be, please be careful to check the petulance of the sailors and restrain the wanton use of firearms. Now this is, uh, they're being very careful. First of all, hints, you know, we're, we're not giving you orders. We're being very nice, we're giving you hints. Um, and notice that they say, uh, you have to be careful, check the petulance of the sailors. This is, you know what sailors are like? Notice that sailors are all those who are not officers. So they're not telling Captain Cook to be careful with the guns. They're saying, oh, you know, all these uh, working class sailors, uh, they, they tend to be fair. In the event, this is this would turn out to be untrue, and it was very often Cook or his uh, his fellow officers who were who were doing the who were doing the killing. More, you should have it in mind. You should have it still in view that shedding the blood of those people, the indigenous peoples, is a crime of the highest nature. They are human creatures, the work of the same omnipotent Author, God, equally under His care as the most polished European perhaps being less offensive, more entitled to his favor. They are the natural and in the strictest sense of the word, the legal possessors of the several regions they inhabit. No European nation has a right to occupy any part of their country or settle among them without their voluntary consent. Conquest over such people can give no just title because they could never be the aggressors. So the first thing that you think about this document is, well, why did they send it? I mean, why would you, you know, I mean, if you, if you, uh, if you talk to your brother and say, oh, I see you're going to the bar, make sure you don't kill anybody, then unless it's a joke, it's because you know something about him. Uh, and indeed, you know, why would they, uh, why would they be interested to do this? Uh, well, it seems uh, not impossible that being aware of how the British had dealt with India that the idea that the uh, local people were not going to be very much respected would be uh, would come to the mind of the of the uh, of the royal royal society. The royal society also asked them to make lists of words in native languages. Um, so there was a, a an intention in the future of being able to communicate. So you can see these two rather contradictory uh, sets of orders. Although of course they cannot possibly carry the same weight because uh, James Cook is a military man, uh, and so the orders which come from his military hierarchy are obviously um, the first ones involved. So it's August 1768, and we are in Plymouth. This is page 40 of the journals. One of Cook's first duties was to read the Articles of War to the ship's company. The Articles of War? Yes, it's a military ship. These rules include discipline, punishment, etc. And this is one of the aspects of life on board ship, although I'll give you many reasons why the, uh, uh, the sailors might have been very happy to go off around the world on Cook's ship. Uh, this is one of the things that they might not be so happy about it. And this is the, the, uh, the kinds of punishments that were involved. And we have the, well, we've been able to get uh, uh, good information about this. First of all, um, here you have, uh, if I'm correct, yes, I think so. this is the Cat of Nine, nine Tails. No, it's not a real one. It's a replica, uh, which uh, I photographed on the replica of uh, Cook's ship, the Endeavour. Uh, and this, as perhaps you have guessed, is used for flogging the sailors uh, if they have uh, uh, broken some rules or not. Uh, also, even by looking at it, but well, certainly if you touch it, um, uh, you can see that this is um, uh, pretty, pretty harsh. Uh, and certainly you will be very rapidly um, covered in blood. Uh, so the very, so, so very, very harsh uh, discipline. Uh, this was not an everyday event, but it was certainly quite common. And uh, uh, one uh, um, scholar studied this and came up with these things on Cook's first voyage. 
which lasted just over three years, there were 17 days uh, when um, the, there were uh, sailors flogged and in, in total um, 330 uh, lashes uh, with the, uh, the catamaran. On the second uh, uh, expedition, 32 instances, 546. Uh, and they're all about the same length, these, these, these voyages. And on the last one, 49, 618. So you can see that um, by the third uh, uh, expedition, uh, Cook is being much more violent. Um, it has been suggested that there have been psychological explanations put forward for this increased violence. Uh, but they don't seem to me to be to be very um, very convincing. Uh, perhaps as uh, captains got older, they just got more violent. Uh, notice that in the diary, you do see uh, in the diary, um, in his own diary, then Cook's diary, um, uh, information about the flogging, about the 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 corporal punishment. Uh, however, not always. Sometimes the day on which there was flogging is marked in Cook's diary as nothing remarkable happened. Uh, so this is obviously something which he considered to be uh, completely uh, unsurprising. Uh, indeed, on page 22, we see the first example uh, in the diary, in the journal. Uh, two, two sailors got 12 lashes each. Uh, one for insulting an officer uh, and one for not flogging his men hard enough when he was flogging. Yes, this, this was a tradition in the Navy that if the, uh, uh, the, the bosun, uh, the bosun's mate who was supposed to do the flogging, if he wasn't flogging hard enough, then he would get flogged. Uh, so, you know, you, you can see that, you know, this is not, um, you know, this is not the, um, uh, 21st century uh, touchy-feely management. So once he'd read the Articles of War, he continued with the work of loading provisions and provisions loaded at the outset of the voyage included 6,000 pieces of pork and 4,000 pieces of beef, nine tons of bread, five tons of flour, three tons of sauerkraut, one ton of raisins, and sundry quantities of cheese, salt, peas, oil, sugar, and oatmeal. oatmeal. Alcohol supplies consisted of 250 barrels of beer, 44 barrels of brandy, and 17 barrels of rum. So you can see the practical uh, difficulties of uh, of uh, loading of loading all the, all this uh, all this stuff up. Um, uh, also, you very quickly on page sixteen uh, see the uh, the dangerous uh, nature of sailing of all sorts at the time because there is one uh, the first accidental death, uh, and uh, and uh, this is also another time for uh, lashing lashing because uh, twelve seamen were uh, sorry two seamen were each sentenced to twelve lashing lashes for refusing to, to eat their allowance of fresh beef. Uh, so this is an interesting side to it. It's very, very harsh discipline, uh, including uh, um, unquestioning uh, uh, obedience on the question of food. Uh, now, Cook very often gives quite a lot of detail um, on the, um, the supplies which he, which he brings in. Uh, and this uh, serves us as, as a reminder of the danger of sailing. The ship will sometimes be three months away from land and there is a huge amount of fresh water to carry. You cannot send up a flare and wait for a helicopter to rescue them. Although when they did, the, they did a, 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 a number of uh, expeditions with the replica uh, at the end of the 1990s, uh, and they discovered that every now and then they did need the flare and the helicopter. Although also in the in the uh, in the replica ship that they travelled around, they had to use modern health and saf safety regulations, so there was no drinking on board ship. Uh, While I think you know the the uh, crew of uh, crew's original endeavour were uh, were often happily drunk. Uh, we see uh, some of the aspects uh, in this, this the, the, these few pages. We see some of the aspects of uh, Cook's interest in science. Uh, this, because he speaks of a dipping needle. You don't dip a dipping needle. Uh, a dipping needle is used for observing the vertical component of the Earth's magnetic field. So it's a, it's a scientific uh, instrument. 
uh, and we see some of uh, Cook's interest in this because he uh, he sees that there's a problem with using it, uh, and so he um, he gets the ship carpenter to make a special swinging table to allow him to use the uh, the dipping needle. Uh, we see also that uh, 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 he knows uh, quite a lot about astronomy uh, and of course can very often will need to um, navigate by the uh, navigate by the stars. Uh, James Cook then he, he he's, he's captain and the captain certainly has a lot of power not only to to punish people uh, but also to um, decide his own course, his own course. Uh, uh, he, so he has a choice. He could stop in, in Rio de Janeiro or he could stop in the Falklands. Uh, and in fact, uh, Rio de Janeiro has a good reputation for uh, welcoming people. And so he decides to stop in Rio. Rio de Janeiro is, is quite, a, is quite a, um, a lively town at the time. It was, it was founded in 1565, yes, and here we are. So it's like two, two, it's 200 years later. Uh, and it became cap capital of Brazil just five years before Cook arrived. Uh, now later, here you, here you have at the bottom right uh, a, a drawing of Rio de Janeiro 50 years after Cook was there. So it probably hasn't changed very much in those 50 years, I wouldn't think. Uh, and Rio de Janeiro today on the uh, at the, at the top left. Uh, now Rio de Janeiro will will actually become even more important a few years later, or well, thirty years later after Cook's uh, first visit. Uh, the Portuguese king moves to Rio de Janeiro, moves the court so that the uh, Rio de Janeiro becomes the capital of the Portuguese Empire because of discontent in Portugal. He actually moves the whole uh, court over to uh, Brazil. Uh, Rio at the time of uh, Cook's passing ex is a big export pl place, exports gold and sugar and diamonds. And uh, the town of Rio de Janeiro has uh, oh, probably around 50,000 uh, inhabitants. Uh, in his journal at this point, uh, we're on page 19, Cook gives details of navigational decisions. At five, took the second reef in the top sails and took down top G yards. Naturally, for us as readers, this uh, technical uh, side of taking down the reefs, it's about rearranging the sails. You, you can see behind me, today's, I, uh, today's background is a model, not the real, not, not the replica of the endeavor, but actually just a, a scale model of the en 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 endeavor. Uh, so obviously we have great difficulty understanding this, but fortunately we were not the audience intended. When Captain, when James Cook, he's not yet Captain, when James Cook wrote his first journal, he imagined that like other journals, he was basically writing for other captains who might come around the same, the same, the same area uh, and would need to know about prevailing winds and about, you know, what kind of sail, uh, where the best anchoring places are, uh, what kind of sails were used and so on. Uh, and this is a matter of life and death. Uh, ships were often um, ship, shipwrecked, people often died. Uh, and so sailors took, uh, captains took it very, very seriously to write down the details. So these indications are written by, from sailor to sail, sailor. Um, to us, uh, these uh, uh, indications might also help uh, to remind us that the uh, that the that sailing for captains and sailors is extremely hard work. Uh, so if I can get onto the next one here, here you have the rigging. This is the rigging of the replica, of course. Uh, and if you as you can imagine, climb, climbing up and down these uh, uh, these riggings is, is extremely um, is, is extremely hard work. And uh, I may well have already mentioned the diet necessary for the sailors and the diet had five, inc included 5,000 calories a day. So this is really a physical work, yeah. Uh, and I'd like to say a little bit more about the crew because it's, uh, it's tremendously important to, uh, to see these uh, expeditions as a, as a collective effort. Uh, and uh, I must say that when I just, I just have to close the door. Um, I must say that when I when I visited the replica in Sydney uh, of the Endeavour, the very first thing you notice is that it's so small, uh, and it's eighty odd people uh, who were on board, and they have really no space at all. I mean, a little bit more when the weather's good and they can be outside, but otherwise, you know, it's it's uh, 
you you need to be if you if you if you and if you live in a studio you have to imagine like 20 people living in it it's it's absolutely tiny and i also wonder about their belongings and uh, somebody uh, from the captain cook society which on the facebook page explained a little bit about what they would bring with them a seaman would have a small ditty bag ditty bag with his marlins pike knife and rope working tools along with perhaps a very small chest with his Sure going rig, his best clothing, and a few trinkets. They were issued hammocks, which were uh, stowed in the hammock netting, and the rest of their belongings were tossed into the hold when clearing for action. So you imagine your belongings would need to be few and compact. There was a ship's bar barber, so they'd get a shave once a week, no need to carry your own razor and supplies. So it was very special kind of life for the crew where they were going into this incredibly now, of course they came from uh, social classes where they didn't have a lot of space at home either uh, and at least on board they would uh, get a they would be, be sure to have enough to eat so there's the rigging when they arrived in rio uh, then they also uh, found not yet and that's not we're not there yet when they arrived in rio they had uh, uh, they found uh, uh, something else that they uh, needed to know uh, and that was that um, they could not uh, simply sail the ship in and anchor what they needed was to get one of the local brazilian experts to get on board ship and to tell them which way to go to avoid uh, the problems on the seabed you see uh, so uh, the sailing is all is, is very delicate and it's best to have an ex, a real expert, the expert in the real seabed to bring you into anchoring, anchoring which makes, makes us think a little bit about later on uh, when Cook is out exploring places where there are no maps and no experts. Uh, and you'll find that very often he is moving very forward, the ship is moving forward very slowly with a boat because they have a couple of boats on board, uh, uh, 50 yards in front, measuring every five minutes. The bunch said, yes, it's deep enough. You can advance this way another hundred yards. Yes, it's still deep enough and so on. So extremely painful and difficult thing. And of course, uh, during this period, uh, during this time, then Cook or one of his uh, crew would be making the map and marking how deep was the sea, bad, uh, the, the sea at each, each point. Once they arrived at Rio, the first officer, their first officer, the, the, so the number number two, uh, was detained by the viceroy. He went he went to, he went to, he went to, uh, ashore, uh, and they promptly locked him in a room until they had checked everything. This is sort of Wild West Judge Justice, uh, the viceroy, then the representative of the King of Portugal, who was controlling Rio. Uh, and this is the sort of Wild West Justice. Yes, they said, okay, well, we'll take one of your officers, we'll lock him up. And now we'll come and check everything and, uh, you know, and if everything's fine, then we'll let him go. Uh, so very rough and ready uh, sort of uh, justice. And this is the same sort of uh, um, methods that Cook will later use. Uh, on several occasions, he will detain uh, uh, native chiefs or, uh, or uh, indigenous representatives until he gets his way. And in particular, in, in cases where items have been taken and not returned. Um, the uh, Viceroy uh, of uh, Brazil imposes very harsh conditions for purchase of provisions. He makes them pay very expensive. Easy to do. They can't go to another shop. They must buy only from the Viceroy. Uh, this is how the empires worked at the time. Just uh, uh, monopolies uh, um, uh, were the, 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 the rule of the time. So here Portugal, but elsewhere Britain controls all, all, all trade. Now they had a, a little uh, difficulty here, and of course po uh, Portugal is a is a competitor to some extent, but they, they they're still a colonial empire, uh, and so you know they don't really want Britain to 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 have any advantage to get any advantage that they they don't have, uh, and so when uh, Cook and his uh, uh, his officers explained, uh, we are going to Tahiti to uh, to observe the transit of Venus. Uh, well, the, the Viceroy said, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, you pull the other one, it's got bells on, you know. It's a, it's a, or, uh, or, uh, or, y ahora una, una historia de indios. Well, that would be Portuguese, not Spanish, but there you go. Um, that is, they didn't, they didn't believe him. Uh, this is a world of several competing empires, in particular Spain, Portugal, Britain, France, and the Netherlands, and suspicion is everywhere. 
However, there were also people on the on the the ship who were uh, m uh, mostly interested by the uh, by by scientific uh, exploration. On, and I'm thinking particularly of Joseph Banks uh, and Solander, who were uh, then botanists, uh, very serious botanists. And uh, the, when the Viceroy said nobody can leave the ship. Uh, Joseph Banks, uh, who was a, came from an elite class and uh, didn't like people telling him what to do, uh, climbed out of the window with solid and slipped of blood to collect plants. That's what they did. And indeed, uh, Banks comes back from the first, first um, expedition with a huge collection of plants, a historic collection of plants, uh, which uh, is tremendously important for, uh, for botanical science. In any case, they eventually uh, got uh, got stocked up, and they left Rio, and they headed south. and uh, And uh, they find this uh, it's very exciting. The uh, uh, Cook writes in his journal, page twenty four, saw many penguins and seals. Uh, now we see we see seals and penguins in the zoo and on the television. We don't get that excited about it. You can imagine Cook's crew seeing these incredible creatures, uh, penguins and the seals uh, for real uh, and saying, oh, I'll be able to tell my family about this when I get home. Here we have uh, Buchan's drawings of meetings in the Tierra del Fuego. I'm sorry, there's a typo there. It's Tierra with an A, of course. Um, so Buchan is the artist or one of the artists, I think there were two, one of the artists on board and the artist is extremely important because of course they, uh, they didn't have their iPhone to take photographs of anything. Uh, and so whether it be animals, plants, whether it be mountains or bays or anything, the ship's artist was an extremely important per person and, and quite good at it as well. Uh, and in this particular case, uh, Buchan draws the meetings with local people um, at the Tierra del Fuego. Uh, and uh, uh, as is his wont, uh, James Cook uh, explains a little bit about the attitude of the locals. Three or four of them came on board without the least hesitation. So the first thing that this, uh, the, uh, this may, uh, this would not have been the first ship they'd seen, or well, in any case, it wasn't the first ship had been to Tierra del Fuego by a long way. Uh, and so in this case, the local people were curious and came on board without the least, uh, 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 the, the, the least hesitation. He also uh, makes a note about uh, uh, local traditions in clothing. And he notes that the women cover uh, the genitals, but the men do not. He has a few minor uh, reflections on local habits and certainly when they're eventually published for the moment he's not planning to publish these journals but when they're eventually published the 18th century readers will be fascinated but he does not have a lot to say the colonial project controls his opportunity to study since he must leave soon and may not leave anybody behind so we can never learn much from Cook's journals about local habits uh, he could never become uh, Primordia, uh, primarily a um, ethnographer uh, because he, he, he's supposed to stay a few days and then keep going because he's got uh, uh, his main job is mapping. Uh, he notes that the local people mostly eat shellfish um, and that they uh, use uh, bows and arrows but also he notes that they have a few European things so they have already exchanged uh, items with previous ships who have married, he, uh, who, which uh, um, have um, anchored over there. He's all also noticed that the local people were not surprised by the firearms. That is that they'd already seen guns. If you imagine, if you have never seen a gun, it is extremely impressive. Even if you know, if you're shooting a bird or something, it appears to be uh, magic. Um, he also notes that the locals did not like European food or liquor. They were not interested in any of, any of that. Uh, a terrible drama took place because uh, uh, Joseph Banks went out uh, on a, uh, a, a trip looking for plants, no doubt, uh, and he took with him two of his black servants uh, and they both died of cold. That's the only story we, ha story we have. It's, it's probably true, but we can't, we, can't, we, we can't prove it. And so they continue going around the very south of South America. They're often not really sure where they are. Uh, they have some adventures, a sailor shot, 
I quote, an albatross as large as a goose, whose wings, when extended, me measured 10 foot to 10 feet. Remember, um, a foot is 12 uh, inches, three feet is a yard. Uh, an albatross's wings can be up to 12 feet, but so there's a very, very big one. Um, and Cook is always very interested in the birds he meets. Now, interesting thing about the character of Cook, he's very, he's very interested in, in, uh, in the nature and, and he's very, very interested in the sea. He never speaks of books he has been reading. He never speaks of social interaction, who he's having di dinner with. He certainly never speaks with feelings. This is more a log than a diary. Uh, it's written for his boss to report back. Uh, uh, and uh, he's a military man. So if he has political or sociological opinions, there's not much of it. Now, in the third book, there will be more because he'll know, he knows he has a wide audience. But even then, it will be very, very limited. It's a huge contrast to the journal of the Frenchman, uh, Bougainville. So that's the Tierra del Fuego again. This is today, uh, not it's changed much, but you can see it's uh, without a mobile phone and a helicopter, it's a pretty scary place to be. Is because Bougainville, the French man, his travels are almost happened at almost exactly the time as Cook's. He travelled around the world from 1766 to 1769 and and published his book in 1771. And his journal is completely different to James Cook's. Bougainville is fundamentally an intellectual. He retraces the history of the colonies he visits. So, for example, Bougainville visits Argentina just as the Spanish are expelling the powerful Jesuits who control part of the country. And Bougainville describes life under Jesuit rule and explains why the Spanish Empire has decided to expel the Jesuits. Uh, and he certainly does not hesitate to give his own political opinions on the future of the colony, completely different from James Cook. Bougainville is a different sort of writer, but also he has a different audience. From the beginning, he has intended it to be publication, whereas Cook is writing for his employers, for his military hierarchy, and for future British captains. And that's all I have time for. For This was, uh, this was video number two. There will be, oh, plenty more. Thank you for listening.